decreed had been signed by the hand of the king, but Daniel still prayed to the Lord. The hungry lions were pacing the den. Here comes supper, one roared. You've been standing round anywhere close. You'd have heard Brother Daniel say, If you're talking about me, forget it, boys, cause I came here to stay. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. When I fall down, to get right up because I didn't start out to play. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. Now the champion marched for 40 days, crying, send me a man to fight. The Israelites said, we've got a brave heart, but her feet are sort of full of fright. Then a boy with a sling and a pocket full of rocks that knew how to trust and pray. Said, if you're going to run, Goliath, you better go now, because I came here to stay. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. When I fall down to get right up because I didn't start out to play. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. This is a problem now. The band throw them in. Them Hebrew boys are gonna fry. Then a little while later they looked in the furnace and they heard Brother Shadrach say, pull up a chair and warm your hands, cause I came here to stay. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. When I fall down, I'm gonna get right up, because I didn't start out to play. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. Amen. I took a look in the old black book and it thrilled me through and through. And if you've been saved and born again, well, it's bound to thrill you too. I was reading along about going home, found my surprise. I'm already there in Jesus, I'm living on the other side. Well, I'm already over on the other side, waiting on my brand new body. I'm sitting up there in the heavenly fire on the right hand of the Father. With my citizenship in heaven, I'm living in Christ, you see. I'm already there in Jesus, I'm waiting on my body to be. Let the heathen rage, come what may, none can bother me. To this world I'm crucified with Christ on Calvary. Been three whole days there in the grave, with him I've been baptized. So being then made dead to sin, I'm living on the other side. Yes, I'm already over on the other side, waiting on my brand new body. I'm sitting up there in the heavenly fire on the right hand of the Father. With my citizenship in heaven, I'm living in Christ, you see. I'm already there in Jesus, I'm waiting on my body to be. Well, if you've been fretting or thinking about quitting or fainting by the way, and you've already passed from death to life, well, brother, you might as well stay. The battle's fought, the victory's won, it's finished, our Lord cried. He's made us more than conquerors, we're living on the other side. Yes, I'm already over on the other side, waiting on my brand new body. I'm sitting up there in the heavenly fire on the right hand of the Father. With my citizenship in heaven, I'm living in Christ, you see. I'm already there in Jesus, I'm waiting on my body to be. Plunged in the old black book three and a half years ago, and I've been walking the Victory Road ever since. And it gets sweeter every day. Amen. People who know not my God just can't understand That spiritual inspired word of God not written by some man They've all agreed by joining hands in a worldwide movement To take that blessed old black book and they set out to improve it 
What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translation? Living Bible and good news everywhere I look. Won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? Preacher made a statement on the said I am the shepherd and my sheep follow me. When voices of a stranger call, they will turn and flee. The words my daddy used to read, I've learned to love so well. But all the other words I hear are strangers to my ears. What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translation? Living Bible and bad news everywhere I look. Won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? The enemy is much too smart to jump right up and say, Forget all you have learned of God, it's not true anyway. Making plans in years to come to take God from our mind by giving us new Bibles changed a little bit each time. What's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translation? Living Bible and bad news everywhere I look. Won't somebody tell me? What's wrong with the old black book? Won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old King James? Now, if you want to know what's right with the King James, I'll show you. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I'll show you why you can't get power out, out any book on the face of this earth except one book. Please ask you chapter 8. God won't bless a Bible unless it's translated under a king. Don't you know that? Please ask you chapter 8. Look at verse 4. God's form of government is a, is a monarchy, not a democracy. You see, please ask you 8 verse 4. Some of you haven't found it yet. You've spent too much time with a boob tube. It's in the Old Testament, brethren. <laughs> Please ask this chapter 8, verse 4. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Amen. The thing right there? I do people think God bless them, a translation made in America. What has America ever been noted for? I ask you. Can you name me one religion that ever started in America that was worth blowing to hell? Name me one. Baptists didn't come from America, they came from Europe. Methodists didn't come from America, they came from Europe. Catholics didn't come to America, they came from Europe. You know what came out of America? Seventh-day Adventism, Jehovah Witness, Church of Christ, Charismatic, Mormon, Latter-day Saints. Why would you think anything spiritual would come out of America? You people aren't spiritual, you're materialists, don't you know that? <laughs> All right, now I don't know what to preach tonight. Isn't that a mess guy get up doesn't know what to preach? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let me ask you, let me ask you this. Uh, did I ever draw here a picture of the whole armor of God? Anybody ever remember seeing the soldier with the sword facing some enemy? Does ever do that one? Two of you remember that. How about sin of the saints? Picture of Samson, David, Jacob, and Lot. Ever do that one? Five of you remember that. Well, it looks like you don't remember that whole armor of God. Do well, I'll draw you that one. <laughs> All right, if you have a Bible, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Begin at verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Now, at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, uh, the Lord gives you a, a military figure there. And the military figure is very common in the Word of God when it's talking about the Christian life. I was turning over my mind what to draw you tonight, and the choir got up and sang something about victory just ahead. And then this uh, young man got up, and lo and behold, if he didn't say he was down in the hog pen, which I drew last night, and then he said he went down to roll-offs, and he taught him how to fight the good fight of faith. So I guess we're where we ought to be. All right, now in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10 there, Paul gives the picture of Christian warfare as a first-century Roman soldier. And he says, Finally, my brethren, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. 
For we rest not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take you the whole armor of God, that you may withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now, when Paul talks about Christianity, he likens it to a number of things. In 1 Corinthians 9, he likened it to a boxing match and a racetrack. In 1 Corinthians 9, he likened it to a husband and uh, taking care of cattle. In John chapter 10, it's like taking care of sheep. In Ephesians chapter 6, it's warfare. Now, uh, I, if I'm going to talk about this for a while tonight, I'm going to talk about something I know something about it. And it's, and it's always a good thing when a preacher talks about something he knows about instead of something he doesn't know anything about. <laughs> and uh, there are many things, seriously speaking, there are many things I know nothing about in this world. I'm a very ignorant man along many lines. When it comes to things like mechanics and uh, appliances and physics and astronomy and uh, those things and finances, I'm one of the dumbest men you've met in your life. I don't understand motors. I have never understood motors. I'm like a woman about an automobile. I think it ought to run. If it don't run, you sell it. That's all I know. <laughs> when my car doesn't work, uh, I go out, lift up the hood, and say, there's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, man. If you turn that ignition, it doesn't work. As far as I'm concerned, it might be out of gas. Sell it. I don't know how to make the cut make thing work. So I'm real stupid about a lot of things. But I come from a long line of infantrymen about five feet two at one end, about six feet seven at the other end. And my, my great-grandfather was a West Pointer, a general, in the Civil War. My uh, grandfather was a general, West Pointer, in the Philippine insurrection. My father was a captain in World War I, a colonel in World War II, down there at the Anniston Ordnance Depot near Bynum, where they made the stuff for the atom bomb. My brother was a sergeant, and I was a lieutenant. We were all infantry, far back as we went. We were all raised to be soldiers, all raised to be shot and killed in the mud and the dirt. We had an engineer, quartermaster, order, and said we're in the whole family. And, you know, when you go through that kind of stuff, you don't ever forget it. I guess it sticks with you. Uh, when I first began to preach, it took me a long time to get used to Christians. I'm not really used to you yet. <laughs> I think some of the body of Christ has never fully accepted me yet as a child of God. <laughs> But when you go through that kind of stuff, it marks. It's in your blood. My daddy's idea of a, of a, you know, of a fun night was to get out battle maps and spread them out on the table. When I was 10, 11 years old, he'd show us the logistics and troop movements for von Kluck's turn on Paris, you know, and then later on, Rommel and Rundstedt and uh, how, Na how Napoleon and Fred the Great messed it up someplace. And the stuff sticks with you. And if I've ever been impressed with one thing, I've been impressed how unlike Christians are from soldiers. Did you know Jesus Christ is called uh, the captain of your salvation in Hebrews chapter 2? Do you know the Lord is called a man of war in Exodus chapter 15? You know what Paul said right before he died? He said, I fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Fought a good fight. You know what Paul said to a young preacher? He said, Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth and tangleth himself for the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Ain't that something? I mean, if you went by the average church today, would you think it was a military, tramp, uh, camp, a military camp training people to fight for God? I mean, you might think it was a civil war or sometime, but would you think it was a camp training people to fight for God? I wouldn't. If you passed by the average church today, you might think it was a dormitory or a sick bay or an old folks rest home or something. But you wouldn't think it was a military camp. And yet the figure that Paul uses here is the figure of a first century dog face, foot soldier, infantry soldier. I've often thought about it. What if you trained uh, Christians like you trained soldiers? Wouldn't that be something? Now, I don't know how they train them now. I've been out of circulation a long time. I've been saved 29 years. So I've been out of circulation a long time. And the army I joined, I'm sure it wasn't like the one they're joining these days. I don't know what the T.O. and T.E. is today, but when I went in... Uh, KP was from 4.30 to 8.30 at night because you had a wood stove, and the stove didn't cool down until 7 o'clock at night. And the, it was an eight-man squad, front and rear rank, and a PFC was somebody. You said, sir, to a corporal. You said, sir, to a corporal. The MPs had loaded 45s that fire once to the ground, once in your belly. <laughs> and there wasn't any argument. You, had to, you couldn't go to some IG and say, discrimination. <laughs> I mean, they'd fire once over your head and once in your belly, and that was the end of it. I've been officer a day at times over there in the Philippines, serving over there in the army of occupation and check people going in and out of the gate. 
I pulled a 45 on the fella and told him to get that sugar out in one of the seat of that car, taking some sugar down to the girlfriend downtown, you know, 10 pounds of sugar. I said, get out in one of that Jeep. The fella said, I won't do it. I've taken that 45 and I'll give you 10 seconds to do it. He said, what would you done if you hadn't done it? I'd have shot him. He said, what would they done about it? Back in those days, nothing. I mean, the one we went into, the MPs were all over six feet tall, and they carried grub handles, like a hoe handle about that long. They'd hit you in the kidneys with that thing. They'd beat a guy to death and then say he fell off the back end of a two-and-a-half-ton truck. There wasn't any fooling around with a thing. <laughs> I had a buddy named, uh, I had a buddy named Paul Kirkendall. He was a knife fighter and a gunman and a con man and a stick man in the midway of the flat joints. I mean, tough character. And he got in the Army, he hadn't been there two days, and they told him to fall out, and he didn't fall out. He stayed up in his bunk. And that top kick came up there in the barracks and said, Soldier, you going to hit the floor? And he said, You make me. <laughs> That's the wrong thing to say back in those days. And that sergeant went down the stairs, and about two minutes later, two MPs came up there. Six feet three. They'd always pick Swedes. Their wrist bone big as your thigh bone. <laughs> and those fellows stood there with that billy club with a lead in the end of it, and they said, Soldier, you going to get up? <laughs> And he said, you make me. <laughs> they did. They like to broke every bone in his body, man. <laughs> and I once thought to myself, now, what if you train Christians like that? Uh, if, you, if, if there's one thing that impresses me, it's the fact the average Christian, there's nothing about him that reminds me of a soldier. And yet that's what you're supposed to be. Can't you see some guy coming down and saying, Captain, I'm not going out for drill this morning. Oh, you're not. <laughs> that's what my old captain would say. His name is Max Sheeney. He's about five feet six, uh, jaw like a shovel and head like a bullet. And that guy, he'd say, oh, you're not. <laughs> and you'd say, no, I'm not. Why aren't you? Well, you yelled at me in ranks the other day, and I don't like your tone of voice. <laughs> you know what he said to you? You know what he said? I couldn't say it. I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, brother. Can't you just see him? I mean, can't you see a guy coming down and saying, Sergeant, I'm not going on the hike today. Oh, you ain't. <clears throat> no, I'm not. Why ain't you? Well, Sergeant, so-and-so standing next to me in ranks been talking about me, and I don't like to be talked to that way. Brother, my old, my old staff sergeant, platoon sergeant, take your hide off, hair and all, and nail it to the wall and saw it away and pack away in the deep freeze, you wouldn't get it out for six months. I've seen an old sergeant desert on my platoon the sergeant stand up there and jaw it off of some guy. When the guy started arguing about his stripes and this and that, old Zirk will take off his shirt and hang it on a bench here and go around behind the barracks and turn that guy away with loose. You wouldn't, you wouldn't tell him he couldn't fight because it had his stripes on. He'd take his stripes off and knock into a cock hat. I've all thought to myself, what if you train Christians like that? The Christians are so sensitive, they're so touchy. If some of you looking at me right now and you're looking at the crease in my pants. You ain't got a lick of sense. I've been up, I've been up before a congregation to look at, are your shoe shine? Are his fingernails clean? My God, people, what are we in anyway? I've often wondered about it. I've often wondered how an unsaved soldier, most of those guys were a bunch of unsaved, dirty rascals. I've often wondered how they had the courage and the guts that God's people lack when God's people have the Bible and the Holy Spirit and a living Savior. I've often wondered about it. Most of the fellows I was raised with are dead in hell right now. A few of them around. There's some veterans around. And back in my day, they were lost and going around, catting around, living like the devil. They were a wild, godless, dirty bunch. But I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something I had. They had guts. They had guts. And some of you Christians don't. Some of you Christians I'm talking to tonight have never stuck your neck out one time for Jesus Christ the day you were saved. You ain't stuck it out one time yet. I wouldn't. God is my witness. I wouldn't die and go home to heaven. As God is my witness, I wouldn't die and go home to heaven without sticking my neck out at least ten times for Jesus Christ and making a fool out of myself for Christ's sake. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Now you take this soldier right here. Did you ever look at him? He has the helmet of salvation. You've got to have that. The helmet's essential. In modern warfare, they still wear helmets. When a man goes up into space, he has a helmet. When a pilot goes up, he has a helmet. You can't get along without the helmet. Look down your passage right there along about verse uh, 14, 15 down there. He says, uh, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he says, uh, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation. See that? 
the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, you're not going to fight the good fight against the devil without the helmet. If I'm talking to some man here tonight that's unsaved, you're wasting your time if you think you're going to overcome the devil without being saved, because you're not going to make it. You've got to have the helmet of salvation. I mean, the head is the most vulnerable part of your body. I mean, a guy can come back, you know, a walking wounded can come back and get his hand bound up, you know, or his leg fixed up or shot in the side. But you can't come back to the aid station with your head in your hand and say, I got me a head wound. <laughs> You've got to have the helmet of salvation. Now he says, loin girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, his feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Count that armament there. And when you count that armament there, you'll find there's a very important piece of armor missing. That piece of armor that's missing is the leg grease, the shin guards. That's missing in that equipment. Do you know why it's missing? Come down about verse 16 to 17 there somewhere, and it says praying with all the prayer and supplication. What verse is that? All right, he says praying. You know why the soldier doesn't need any shin guards? Because he's covered. He's on his knees. His knees are covered. That soldier has offensive equipment, defensive equipment. You know, one time I got here and some fellow preached, I think it was some fellow like Bob Shuler or James McGinley, one of those old timers, one of those holdovers in the 19th century. And I've heard a bunch of them, you know, like Hahn, Dr. Hahn, Fuller, and Bob Jones, some of those fellows. And I was watching one of those fellows preach one time. And I got to watch them. I was just a new Christian. And I said, uh, I kind of dialogued with the Lord. I said, Lord, what is it about those fellows? They have a certain kind of a, of a, a ring and there's a certain kind of a metal about them. I said, I don't understand it. I said, so they got something this new bunch of preachers don't have. And I said, this new bunch of preachers, some of them are fundamental, some of them are solid, some of them are great soul winners, some of them are even great Bible teachers. But there's, there's just something there, that's, I don't know what it is, I just can't get my hand on it, something that's missing. I said, what is it? The Lord said, well, Pete, how do you make a good soldier? And I said, well, I don't know. The Lord said, you persecute him, don't you? I said, yeah, that's how you get a good soldier. The way you get a good soldier is you persecute him. You say, suck in your gut. Bop! <laughs> the court martialing guys over there, you know... Paris Island for hitting guys in the stomach. How are you going to teach a guy to suck his gut and if you don't hit him in the stomach? Suck in your gut. Pop. <laughs> guy goes by there says, you want that button soldier? Yeah. Sew it on, you know. You want that canteen? Dump it down your pant leg. Let the water run down you. Purse you. You take a fellow and put a gas mask on him. You run him down a road. I'll tell you, brethren, one of the great joys in life, if you've missed it, is running down a Georgia road in August or July with a gas mask on <laughs> and 68 pounds in your back. And they have a little old filler in them, you see. And you want to breathe. <laughs> and you can't because the filler won't work that quick. And you're running down that thing, the sweat's coming up. You can't open the thing. So the sweat, I've had to sweat up to my lower lip, man. You like to drown your own sweat and can't get rid of the thing. And these planes are simulating strafing, you know, come by. Oh, that thing. You're running down there and you want to go. <laughs> you can't and you're going. <laughs> <laughs> what you do is persecute. Well, my, when I went in, I was a little old squirt, man, that, that Springfield rifle was almost as long as I was. My sergeant one time, he got mad at me about something, he came up to me and he said, he put his hand right up here, and he said, why you little squirt, I ought to take you by your ears and peel you right down. <laughs> and when he ran his hands out like this, I could just almost feel the skin going. <laughs> <laughs> got out there, I never, never forget one day, got out there, had me an ingrown toenail, bad one, turned purple, bled, you know. I went down there and stood in line in the infirmary. I guess they figured I was a gold brick. And I came in there, you know, and missed a hike because of it. You know, they, should, they thought I was goofing off. And I came in there, and that PFC, big old boy sitting there, said, what's your trouble? I said, ingrown toenail. I said, let's see it. Put my foot up there in a stool like that. That guy took off that sock, took one look at that thing, took a pair of scissors, took the small end of the blade, put it under the nail, ran it all the way down the base of the nail, clip, took a pair of forceps, took half the nail, pulled the nail like that. Wrapped a bandage around it and said, next. <laughs> next. <laughs> Man, I was standing up. <sighs> Man, my face was white. My face was white as that shirt, man. I never felt like just screaming all my life. Next. <laughs> Got out there. Had a first day in KP. I had to cut a bunch of tomatoes up. You know, he cut tomatoes for 200 million. That's a lot of tomatoes, you know. And I was cutting away on those tomatoes, and I found a quick way to get, you know, get it done real quick. And I had a real razor-sharp knife, and I finally got that thing down to a science where I could just 
come down like this and get off about an eighth of an inch each time. And I got looking around somewhere and whoosh, came down there and went halfway through that finger. I'm right at the bone. The blood just went through all that salad. And that mess sergeant turned around, you blank, you blank, you don't name one at me. And you just have to duck, man. If they hit you, it's your fault for getting out, not getting out of the way. <laughs> and I ducked off that thing, grabbed that bloody stub and ran down the dispensary and going out the mess hall door, dripping blood all the way down the hallway. I looked back over my shoulder and I saw the old mess sergeant standing there looking at that salad. Reached over and took some ketchup, put it in there. <laughs> yeah, man, they ate it. They ate it. <laughs> they enjoyed it. <laughs> you go down that mess hall with that tin tray, and the guy goes slop, slop, slop. I was over in uh, in uh, uh, Kaiser's Lauter, and about uh, two weeks ago, went to an army mess hall over there, Air Force mess hall, rug on the floor. Rug on the floor in a mess hall, boy. Whew, man, three kinds of meat. Good night. Three kinds of meat. <laughs> Waiters waiting on the tables. In a mess hall, man. Waiters waiting on the table. <laughs> boy, the one we go through, the guy take a scoop there and slop, you know, slop, slop, going down the line. Some kids say, hey, we got no choice. Mess starts and say, yeah, you got a choice, sonny. You can take it or leave it. <laughs> you know, some, if you train God's people like that, I wonder how they'd react. I bet if you took a church of a thousand people train them like that, you lose 200 of them a week for about f three or four weeks. I mean, if you don't like it, lump it. That's how they train them. The Bible says, endure hardness a good soldier, Jesus Christ. That's the business. You ought to see how we used to train them. I'll tell you another blessing you've missed if you haven't had it. If you've never been in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas at 114 in the shade in July in a, in a review, you've missed it there, too. Those troops stand out there, you know, present arms, then parade rest, and then attention, then present arms, then port arms, right shoulder arm, left shoulder arms. That band goes down the field and back up, down the field and back up. Follow like flies, man. If you dropped a rifle out there behind this place tonight, I'd know it was a rifle hitting the ground. I'm, I don't know about an M14 or a 16, but a Springfield or an M1 has a certain sound that when it hits the ground, I'd know it anywhere. That, that sling kind of goes slap when it hits the ground. You'd stand out there in that band go flop They send the meat wagon out at the ambulance round after and pick them up. I was standing out there one day at attention, you know, where we would present arms, had that rifle up there, bayonet, long bayonet in that Springfield, you know. Stand up there and a fly got in my nose. And I was up there going. That old sergeant behind me says, At ease. I pulled that bandit study, got my nose again. Now I stand there going, <laughs> Old sergeant says, At ease. About that time, the guy in front of me begins to go like this. <laughs> He's an arm length ahead of you in ranks, you know. He's going like this. That old sergeant says, at ease. <laughs> he don't pay a bit of attention to him. <laughs> he goes like this, pretty soon he goes, like Man, I stepped out of the way like that, that guy goes, whack, right down there. I remember, I just, you know, just green, man, 18 years old. I remember looking down at him like that, whites of his eyes, back in his head, chomping at his, chomp, you know, foaming at the mouth. <laughs> Fantastic sight, man. <laughs> And they sing, you know, right shoulder arms forward, punch down, a thumb, a thumb, a thumb, a thumb, a flop, a thumb, a thumb, a thumb, a thumb. You know, you know, some of God's people, if the Lord had you come out visitation day and the temperature was 95 degrees, some of you wouldn't show up. You know, what's wrong with the Christians? They're soft. They're soft. I don't know what a bottom it is, but they're just soft. I don't know why it is. It seems to me with the Holy Spirit in you and the complete revelation in your hand and a home in heaven and sure promises, it seems to me you'd be the bravest people in the world. It's a strange business, isn't it? My job in the, in the Army was a, what they call a D.I. in hand-to-hand. -hand. And my job was to teach uh, young men how to kill each other any way you could kill them. And when you ran out of tools, you kill them with your hands. Every warfare has offensive weapons, defensive weapons. The soldier has an offensive weapon, that's the sword. He has a defensive weapon, that's the shield. I've observed that some Christians are great on defense, 
They can pray and trust God and pray and trust God and be thankful and claim Romans 8.28 till the cows come home, but they never get in a lick for God. They don't know how to use the offensive weapon. Some Christians go to the offense, but the first time the devil hits them, they quit. They don't have any defense. Now, you know the military arts. You've heard about them. They, they all have offense and defense. If a boxer is leading out here, he's covered here. If he's coming up here, he's covered off here. In, in karate, they don't have just strikes. They have blocks. There's blocks and blows. You take in that, in that bayonet drill, they take a fellow out here like this, and put him up like this, and put him a rifle out in front like that, and they put him out there, they put his feet like this. I don't care if it's uh, Aikido or Kendo or Karate or Judo, whatever it is, the feet are always like that. They're like that because if they're like that, you can't push him off this way or this way or this way or this way. If he's got his feet like this, he's off balance front and rear. If he's got his feet like this, he's off balance sideways. So they're like this. And you get him out like this and put that rifle under his arm and it rests out there ahead of him on the butt of that rifle. You tell that fellow to make a long thrust. And he takes that rifle and the first one is from the man's throat. And when he goes to the throat, he's out like that. Then if he misses, the fellow steps back, he takes the butt out of that rifle and swings up. And if he misses, he goes for his face. If he misses, he goes across the throat. And if he misses, he goes on in that way. And every one of those movements like that is forward, every, every one of those movements. There isn't one movement in that bayonet drill that isn't forward. If a man's standing like this and there's a man behind him, you have to turn into him. When you turn into him, you don't step back. If he's behind you, you step forward. Pull up here to guard, come down like this, and face him again. Did you know every movement that drill is forward? You say, what's that got to do with the Bible? Don't you know? Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, I press forward. You know what you Christians are always doing? You're always messing around back there 10, 15 years ago. Boy, did we ever have a meeting here last year? How about the one you're going to have this year? Well, you know, years ago, me and my wife broke up, you know, and the Christians don't forget it, and people talk about it, and my folks never did forgive me. Quit looking your wounds. Forward, boy. They ain't a movement that bad, that drill is backward. They're all forward. You can't go around licking your uh, wounds and worry about something happened back there 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. You can't live in the past. God's people are supposed to be living up there in the future. Oh, we used to train them. My old bayonet instructor was a fellow named Bronkhorst. And Major Bronkhorst, he, uh, he had a black belt back in the days. Only about five white men had it. There wasn't any first, second, third day and all that business. You had it or you didn't have it. My old boy was about 50 years old. Still see him standing up there, that bayonet like that. Black belt around his coveralls, German accent. Got his citizenship fighting in the American Army. Don't think he drank or smoked. He'd stand up there and say, come to the guard position. <laughs> You get out there and get that thing out. He gets you out like this, that rifle out in there like that, and then make you let go with his hand. Hold his hand behind you. Your rifle's at an angle like that. Weighs about 12 pounds. Make you hold up like that. I've been out there, man, that drill field at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, out there with that thing out like that. You quit sweating. You sweat, all your sweat's gone. You just glow like a stoplight. <laughs> and that old thing's up like that, and pretty soon that whole field will begin to tick this way. And then it get black, you know, just go black, little, little lights go ping, 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 ping. <laughs> I used to stand there and tell that field, hold still, hold still, hold still. <laughs> that field go like that. <laughs> you say, how'd you train him when you got your commission? Just like they trained me, brother. Do unto others for they do unto you. <laughs> I'd get him out there and tell him, kill him, boy, get him any way you can get him. Get him, kick out his knee, break his back. Go put your helmet in head first. If you get by his throat, use your teeth. Pull out the jugular vein. Get him. Folks, oh, it's awful rough stuff. Well, let me tell you something. If unsaved people have to go through that for the government, and they do, what do some of you Christians ought to go through for Jesus Christ? But some of you don't. It's an amazing thing to me. I've had them out there in the Philippine Islands, out there in Manila, and that's another blessing you may have missed. You get out there in Manila down with the equator and get out there in a July or August sun, about the time of the rainy season, I've had those troops out there, Filipino scouts, 200 and 400 at a time, and get them out like that, that bandit like that. One old boy's bandit begins to come down. I'd say, get him up. <clears throat> begins to come down. Up. <laughs> He'd say, Lieutenant, I am very, very sick. I'd say, you got your slip from the medics? No. Up. Get him up. He'd start to come down again. I'd say, all right, one more time, double time down the road. I'd make him double time a quarter mile down, quarter mile back. Hold the rifle up in the air like that. 
He began to slip again. I'd get him back up. Okay, take off, boy. He ran off down the road. I saw one one day he ran about 200 yards down that road like that. And then, bam, just dropped in the middle of that old road. Boy, that rifle bounced out there about 10 feet. All those fellas in the ranks, you know, turned around and saw him. Like that, you know. <laughs> I said, okay, good man, worth more money. Went till he went on his face. Went till he found his face. Good man, worth more money. Get him up! <laughs> you say, where's that in the Scripture? Didn't you ever read it? Didn't you ever read when Christ was in Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26? He went a little further and fell on his face. You been alone there? I bet some of you birds in this building tonight, 15 to 60 years old, have never yet gotten in such an agony of prayer. You've been flat to your face in the floor where you live. Hey, no soldier, I don't know what you are. Paul says, endure hardness, a good soldier, Jesus Christ. My, how we used to train them. I've had pretty good reports lately. They kind of picked up their training and speed in the last year. I hope they have. I hope they have. Back when I was in, they allowed 2% casualties in training because it was wartime. They figured if you lost 2% of them, it was just tough apples. I've been out there in Corregidor and Bataan cutting down bamboo with a bunch of those fellas. That's another blessing you missed, cutting bamboo down in a bamboo thicket. <laughs> and you get out there, if you take off your shirt, it itches you to death. You leave it on, you sweat to death, and you slap the mosquitoes all the time you're cutting. And that green bamboo, your machete goes every way except where you want it to go. But every two or three minutes, when those fellas steal back there and steal water out of the can, out of the, uh, uh, well, not a lister bag, the five-gallon cans. And I called him in a couple of times. I said, now, if one of you guys goes back there and steals water again, I'm going to kick that water over, and the whole platoon going to work up here all day with nothing. About ten minutes later, I caught a guy creeping back there to get him a drink. I called those guys in, 40 of them, put them around that can, opened it in that can, kicked that can over, let it run off down the hill. I'm working with them. I said, if I can do it, you can do it. I've seen those troops stand there. Look at that water running down the hill. <laughs> Lick the lips. <laughs> Some of you folks thinking, oh, what a mean fella. <laughs> you know something, if an unsaved man can go through that for the government, what you ought to be doing for Jesus Christ right now, huh? Get my quiet here, Pastor. <laughs> Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. Feet chop of the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? That means always be prepared to preach the gospel wherever you go. Don't walk anywhere you can't preach it. Don't be anywhere you can't preach it. Always have it a fix so if you have to give a witness, you can give a witness. You notice in this equipment the soldier has, there's nothing for his back. Did you notice that? He's not supposed to turn around and run in action. He's supposed to face the enemy. God makes no allowance for your cowardice. The Bible says, stand fast, stand. Having done all, stand. Stand, therefore. God, God allows you to be courageous. When I sign a Bible, I always sign a Bible for young men and sometimes. Joshua 1 9, because that's military orders to a commander. And he said, Fear not, I have commanded thee. Be strong, be of good courage, don't be dismayed. Go get them. Go get them. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is over there in 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, there was a case over there where Joab is up against the Syrians and the Ammonites. And he has his brother, Abishai, with him to fight with him. And when they get up there before the battle, Joab says to Abishai, he says, if the Ammonites are too much for you, I'll help you. If the Syrians are too much for me, you come and help me. You know, which is a kind of peculiar battle plan. I mean, what if they're both too much for you? <laughs> and he just even taken that into account. He said, if they're too much for you, I'll help you. If they're too much for me, you come help me. And then he said this. He said, and be of good courage. Let us play the man for our people and the cities of our God. And may the Lord do that which seemeth him good. And he drew not a battle, and they fled before him. You want to know how to get to be a man? Act like a man. Act like a man till you are a man. You know how you get to be a man? By playing like a man, that's how. The first four or five times you may be scared to death. Go ahead anyway. I believe it was Field Marshal Ney about to enter battle, and somebody said to him before he got on his horse, General, your knees are knocking together. And he looked at his knees and he said, if you knew where I was taking you, you'd shake worse than that. And then got on the horse and went on in. God does make allowances for cowardice. Uh, now listen, I didn't say God does make allowances for being scared. Any man's ever been in combat, been scared half out of his wits, if he was sane and sober. A man who isn't scared in combat's a fool. And he ever been in an electrical storm? 
Any of you have been in a place where lightning was hitting about two or three times every minute within, say, 100 yards or 50 yards of you? Well, that's kind of like an artillery bombardment, except they don't last as long. <laughs> and when that stuff starts coming in, you know what the fellows are yelling that don't have any God? They're calling for the mothers. That stuff starts listening. There's many old boy out there, 25 and 30 years old, back in the state telling dirty jokes and play girl on the inside of his footlock and all that kind of stuff and living like the devil. And that stuff starts coming down. He's out there yelling, Mother, 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 Mother. Yeah, man. Old German is that what they call a screaming Mimi. Sound like a woman. A shell come over and go, I'll give you nervous tension, man. <laughs> Keep you awake at night. <laughs> Japs have those old shells sometimes with whistles on them, and sometimes the stabilizers wouldn't work, and they'd come down, they'd go... <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't kill you any dead in one that didn't make a noise, but it was demoralizing. <laughs> They found one old southern gentleman way back in the regimental bivouac area one night after one of those attacks, and they said, what you doing back here? He said, I heard that bomb said. I heard that bomb said. <laughs> they said, that bomb didn't say anything. He said, that bomb talking? I heard that bomb said. <laughs> they said, that bombs don't talk. They just got a whistle on. He said, I heard that bomb said. <laughs> they said, well, what did it say? He said, that bomb said, boy, you ain't never going back to Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> All right now, a soldier has loin girded by the truth, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He's up against three enemies. The first of these enemies is uh, the world. World's a harmless little fella. Doesn't have any armor. Doesn't have any sword. Doesn't have any spear. Doesn't have any shield. Comes at you with a buck in one hand, a frog stick in the other. The Bible says, Love not the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 1, Christ died for us. He might deliver us from this present evil world. And the world is subtle. The world comes at you and says, uh, You've got to make a living. Everybody else does it. We always have done it. A little bit doesn't hurt. All depends on how you look at it. I mean, my conscience doesn't convict me. You've got to get married. <laughs> You've got to make a living and put it to you. The world's subtle. When the devil wants to take the world system and get a Christian, he doesn't treat a Ph.D. any different. He treats a high school freshman. The devil's dealing with a four-star general isn't any different than his dealing with a buck private. He says, we always have done it. A little bit doesn't hurt. We know when to quit. My conscience doesn't convict me. Depends on how you look at it. You've got to get married. You've got to make a living. Don't change. You want to know why I have so little respect for some educated people? It's because they think they're above operations like that. There's a man and woman in this building didn't sin in one of those things I just said. And when you sin, you use one of those. The devil don't even have to shuffle them. They'll work anywhere. One time a young lady got up at a Youth for Christ meeting and gave a very uh, startling testimony. She'd been a model and was on her way to be a movie star, and she got saved, quit the whole thing, came out of it. Very remarkable conversion. And when she got through, one other young lady at the table said to her, she said, you know something? She said, I just would have given the world to have a testimony like that. And then the young lady said, you know, that's just what it cost me. That's just what it cost me, the world. All right, you're up against the world. Then you're up against the flesh. Paul never said, resist the flesh. He said, resist the devil. When it comes to the flesh, Paul didn't say resist the flesh. You know what Paul said about the flesh? He said, flee youthful lusts. The Bible takes it for granted. You get torn with the flesh and playing with the flesh, you're going to get in trouble. I know this generation. This generation thinks they're smart. This generation brags about the sin. This generation thinks there's a purity as a joke. They think chastity is something disgusting. They think it's a shame not to be experienced and soiled. Remind you of some clothes down on the counter at a bargain store where it said, slightly soiled, greatly reduced in price. We got a generation that pretends to have all kinds of situation ethics and all kinds of standards. The fact is, the flesh will take you to hell. 
Now, look at here, boys and girls. You take one, and your lungs get used to it. You take two, and your lungs get used to it. You take six, and your lungs get used to it. You take a pack a day, and your lungs get adjusted to it. You take two packs a day, you're a dead man. You go up in the hospital and say, what's wrong with you? The fellow's lying there with an ashtray on the table, and he says, well, <coughs> Brother Duckman, I, <coughs> I'm just in here <coughs> for some tests. They don't know what's wrong with me, but <coughs> he's going to spit his lungs out, man. You know what the Japanese say, don't you? They say, man, take drink, drink, take drink, drink, take man. All sin is like that. I mean, pornographic pictures won't do it. It'll have to be sex deviation after a while. Won't turn you on, have to be perversion after a while. Won't turn, won't turn you on, have to be masochism after a while. Won't turn you on and be sadism after a while. You said, ever happened to me, it happens all the time. You know how people get like Charles Manson and know the son of Sam? You know how I get that way? Just messing around with the flesh, boy. You say, well, I'd never do that. You don't know what you do. You get fooled in that flesh and give that thing an inch, it'll take a foot and a yard and a mile. You know what Paul said? Paul said, flee you for us. The smartest man in the Bible, according to Paul, was Joseph. He was a coward. <laughs> He ran. You get fooled with the flesh and fooled with the devil, you get yourself in a mess. You come around the devil and say, look at here, devil. I just want to tell you something. I've been saved and I've been born again. I'm going to have no more truck with you, the likes of you. I just came around and tell you off and say goodbye. You know what the devil will say? He'll say, well, so glad, so glad you got right. I wish I could live it myself. Won't you come in and tell me about it? You go in and sit down for tea, you know, or coffee. You're not careful, you're liable to stay all night. That Bible says, flee youthful us. All right, you're up against the world. You're up against the flesh. And finally, you're up against the devil himself. That Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking who may be devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren which are in the world. My Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion. You may have noticed in the years I've been with you up here, and Brother Modish has had me in, you may notice through the years you haven't heard me joke much about the devil. I don't joke about the devil. The devil ain't no joke. If a devil could have his way in your life tonight, he'd take everything you have. I'm standing up here talking. If that Bible is right, there's somebody going to fail right now. And if he could take my wife and take my children and cripple me for life and take my health and take my money and put me in hell, he'd do it and never give me the time of day. I heard a fellow one time up north joking about the devil. He said, you know, he's going to tie a knot in the devil's tail. <laughs> you ain't going to tie an old knot in the devil's tail. That Bible says your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion. Matter of fact, they'll open right now and a full-blooded 600-pound African lion came there, had nothing to eat for about four days. You wouldn't meet him in this building trying to tie a knot in his tail. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't think all of you could get through two exits, but you could. <laughs> You take, you take the devil goes about as a roaring lion, and I've heard a missionary say, I heard a missionary say this one time, he'd been in Africa for about 20 years, he said, there are two things about lions you never get used to. I said, what's that? He said, well, in the first place, he said, you never get used to their roaring. He said, it, and he said, I've heard them roar at night many a time. But he said, on all the time I was over there, I never got used to that thing at night. He said, in the middle of the night, you hear that thing out there go, oh. And he said, make the hair come up the back of your head. He said, the next thing about that lion was, he said, you never got used to how far they could jump. He said, every fellow ever got killed, every native out there ever got killed by a lion, got killed because he figured the lion couldn't jump as far as it did. Some of them said they can jump one and a half length. One fellow said they jump one length. One fellow said, well, they jump two lengths if they're running. <laughs> and every guy that got clawed to death figured he couldn't make the distance, and he made the distance. And the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom may be devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren which are in the world. That's a great comfort. That verse says, knowing the same afflictions, what afflictions? The things you're going through, the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren which are in the world. Did you know there isn't anything you're going through right now that some other Christian isn't going through? 
You know, the devil get doing with you, he'll get you feeling sorry for yourself. He'll get you thinking, well, God never called a Christian to do what I'm going through. But he has. There's anybody in this building, and I can't find another Christian going through what you're going through right this minute. You say, I got a little girl, she's dying of leukemia. I know where one is in Baton Rouge. You say, my husband went off and left me. I know three of them in Pensacola, just left them last week. He said, well, I'm this and that, and the doctor said it's malignant. There are a thousand Christians tonight where it's malignant. I remember one time in my life when I was going through a very dark period of my life, at least what it seemed to be dark, looking back across it, I can see where it was a blessing, and I just didn't appreciate it. You know, but hindsight's always better than foresight. And going through that thing, I said to myself, Lord, you just couldn't possibly call me to do what I've got to do under these circumstances. <laughs> you know how you get kind of... Maybe you don't do that. I do that with the Lord, you know. You know, I, I figure if he knew what I knew, he wouldn't handle things like he handled them, you know. You get that way sometimes. Now, of course, you good people don't do that, you know. But anyway, <clears throat> I said, now, Lord, it's just impossible. And you know something? In less than one week, I met two other preachers in the same boat. Less than a week. I talked to the fellow out in Kansas City one time. And he said, would you tell me something? He said, how come there aren't any Christian men around? He said, I've got 40 guys that work for me, and they all cuss and drink and smoke and live like the devil. They all laugh at the Word of God, and I've witnessed all of them. They don't pay any attention to me. He said, aren't there any Christian men around anywhere in this world? I said, sure, sure, a lot of them. He said, where, where, where? I said, well, I know four of them over in Panama City and ten of them over in Pensacola and three of them up in Memphis. And I know a couple of real good ones in Canton, Ohio, and four or five up in Chicago, and there's some good ones out in Los Angeles. <laughs> he said, oh... And he said, but why doesn't God let us get together and have fellowship? And I said, because, brother, if the Lord let us all us Christians get together and have fellowship, we just have a good time and let the world go to hell. That's right. You know that? Now, I don't know how you do it up here. You'll have a roundup day with that roast steer, and you have pretty good times up here. But you take down south when we have dinner in the ground and all day preaching down there. That thing gets so good that you just don't want to quit. Do you ever go out there and look at that table with 54 kinds of food on it? I've counted 54. You know, you come down that thing and here's hamburger, stew, beef, barbecue pork, pork chops, steak, ham, fried chicken, broiled chicken, roast chicken, barbecue chicken, chicken chicken, chicken burlu, <laughs> chicken gumbo, chicken and rice, stewed chicken, chicken and dumplings, fried chicken, biscuits, cornbread, brown bread, white bread, cheese, black-eyed peas, crowder, uh, crowder peas, purple hull peas, black-eyed peas, English peas, green beans, string beans, banana pudding, German chocolate cake, iced tea, hot biscuits, rice, gravy, French fried potatoes, boiled potatoes, baked potatoes, Spanish rice, spaghetti, macaroni, 54 kind, man. <laughs> you know, you get one of those things, you know, anybody want to leave for supper? <laughs> <laughs> You never tasted nothing, man. You taste fresh, fried trout mixed with yellow rice, yellow rice, and fried green tomatoes. And just a little bit of pepper sauce on that, you know, get it just right. <laughs> you get down there and get like that, you know, and some guy gets up and preaches from 9 to 12, and next guy gets up and preaches from 2 to 4, 3 or 4 of them, you know, put on any... Kept the next bunch preached from seven to nine. And all you do is just eat and pray and preach and sing. And it's just so good, man, that Monday morning you go back to work, it's just like going back to hell. <laughs> that's right, brother. That's right. And you know what you know what God does? You know what God does? God take uh, one fellow and put him up here in Rochester and take another fellow and put him down in Memphis. Take another fellow and put him over in West Virginia and take another fellow and put him over here and separate you so you can reach people and get them saved. That's why he does that. Oh, and you take the devil. Goes about as a roaring lion. The devil has three methods by which he works. Those three methods are called compromise, camouflage, and counterfeit. One of the devil's greatest ways to work is by counterfeit. You say, what is counterfeit? The devil's greatest masterpiece is not an RSV. Anybody knows that's a counterfeit. The devil's greatest masterpiece is a Bible that looks like a Bible that's not a Bible. The devil's greatest masterpiece is a church that looks like a church that's not a church. The devil's masterpiece is a thing that looks like a Christian that's not a Christian. Counterfeit. Camouflage. We rest not against flesh and blood. How many times have you thought it was flesh and blood? I'll bet you Lester Roloff is tempted to think that it's flesh and blood many a time. 
You get in a fight like that, you just can't help it. When you see your adversary right there, you just swear it was them. <laughs> but we rest not against flesh and blood. You know who's trying to shut down that place down there? The devil. The devil. But he'll use people. I preach every year at the buffet of the home for girls up there in Mississippi, every year between right after Christmas and get up there. And some of you folks ought to see that thing. You ought to see that thing. That fella is doing what the government can't do with half the money and take the government to do it. I was out in uh, L.A. I'll get back to this in a minute. I was out in L.A. And, and a fella asked me to go out there and preach at a rehabilitation center. I got out there and tried to preach and nobody had to come. So most of them left and the rest of them were there, left in the middle of the message. When it was all over, I said to the guy, I said, what's going on around here? I see, I see boys and girls in all these cabins together. I said, look like somebody smuggling pot in over there. I said, they got them all mixed up here, all this mix up. Nobody required to do anything, nothing. I said, what's the deal? He said, well, that's how it's run. It's a government place. I said, well, how'd they get them rehabilitated? I said, can you get pot in here? He said, yeah, they got the grass shuffling all around. They can get it in. And I said, well, how do you get them rehabilitated? And he said, they don't. And I, and I said, well, what do you mean they don't? He said, that ain't the idea. He said, the idea is to keep them in here so they can keep the money coming in and keep the thing going. Now, listen. You've got one bunch of people take your money and take your money and spend it to keep a kid ruined. And they're trying to shut down a guy that's trying to get the money by faith to get your kid right. You know what that is? That's the devil. The God of this world. He works by camouflage. I mean, you get in your home and say to you, your husband doesn't love you. He say he love you, doesn't say love you anymore. Last time you asked him, do you love me? He said, yeah, I love you, shut up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> doesn't buy you anything anymore. Didn't notice your new hat. Didn't notice your new dress. Troubles your husband. About that time, the devil comes to your husband and said, uh, spend all your money. Not taking care of the checks. Writing out checks, you know. Like going out of style. Getting sloppy. Clothing. Doesn't take care of herself like this anymore. Doesn't care for you. Probably stepping out on you. Gets you to arguing and throwing things at each other and quoting scripture at each other if you're saved. <laughs> and he gets you going like that and the devil slips out the window. Nothing funnier than the UN. You know, uh, the, the usual nonsense. <laughs> And all those, all those fellows sitting in there and the devil comes in and says, see a bunch of imperialistic, capitalistic, Wall Street dictators, get them! Goes around the corner and says, see a bunch of communistic, fascist, anti-God people, get them! They all get going to each other, cutthroat, teeth and throat, steps out the window. He's the God of this world. He works for compromise. That's his greatest weapon. I'll illustrate that and I'll be through. What's compromise? Well, here's compromise. Fella comes out and puts up a billboard up like this in about 1930. Puts up the billboard, and here's a young man smoking a cigarette. And it says, uh, Chesterfield, they satisfy, or I'd walk a mile for a camel. John the Baptist walked a mile for a camel. For him, it was a suit of clothes. <laughs> and I'd walk a mile for a camel. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if clothes make the man, what was John? <laughs> and it says... They satisfy, you see. And then along about 1936, the guy comes out there and puts up a billboard, and the fellow's smoking, and a young girl's watching him. And about 1940, he comes along, puts up a picture, and the fellow's smoking, the girl's lighting the cigarette. And about 45, he puts up a billboard, and the young lady got the cigarette, and he's lighting hers. And 1950, she's got her own cigarette. You've come a long way, baby. Yeah, you sure have. Which way? You know what they think out in the world? Out in the world, you know what they call that? They call that progress. You know what they call out the state universities? That's learning. That's getting educated. That's learning to be more tolerant and broad-minded and put up with things. That's progress, boy. You know what in the Bible? Well, that's damnation spelled H-E-double-L. -L. I used to tell people back in the 19, uh, late 1940s, you'd see the day when doctors would recommend beer for babies. And sometimes congregation would laugh at me and wink and punch each other. They don't anymore. I've seen that thing in the newspaper a dozen times in the last ten years. Now, you know what compromise is? Watch it. Fella says, I believe when an unsaved man dies, he goes to hell and burns forever in a lake of fire. They read some books. I believe when an unsaved fellow dies, he goes to hell. But it may not be a real lake of fire, but it's something like it. Get an educated boy. Reads a few more books. I believe when a fellow dies unsaved, he goes to hell and he burns, but he couldn't burn forever. 
After all, God is love. Reads a few more books. I've been wanting to say if a fellow dies, he goes to hell and he burns, but it couldn't be real fire or he'd burn up. It must be figurative. Reads a few more books. I'd even learn to say if a fellow dies, he goes to hell, but we don't know what hell is like. Reads a few more books. I'd even learn to say if a fellow dies, he dies, but we don't know what happens to him. Reads a few more books. I'd be and people die, uh, probably later on they'll all get saved anyway, and we can't be sure about it for sure anyway. Reads a few more books. I'd even learn to say if a fellow dies, something happened to save a fellow, because after all, there is no such thing as saving and unsaved. Reads a few more books. Nobody can know what happens to a fellow who dies, but I'm sure if you float around the hospital room a while, there's life after life. <laughs> and reads a few more books. I believe when you're dead, you're dead like a dog. You know what you call that? That's called education. Let's try it one more time with feeling. <laughs> I got one invitation to preach at Tennessee Temple, for what I'm about to say, and never got invited back. I'll be the King James Bible, the Word of God, from cover to cover, including the cover. Amen. Read a few more books. I'll be the King James Bible, the Word of God, except for the paragraph, chapter, and verse markings. Read a few more books. I'll be the King James Bible, the Word of God, except for the chapter and verse markings and italics. Read a few more books. I'll be the King James Bible, the Word of God, but after all, it's from the Greek, and there are other reliable translations, too. Read a few more books. I'd be the King James Bible's reliable translation, but the ASV and the new ASV are reliable too. Read a few more books. I'd be the King James Bible reliable, but there are other better translations that are truer to the older and best manuscripts. Read a few more books. I believe the oldest and best manuscripts are the closest to the original text. You'd have to go back to the original text to get the true meaning. Read a few more books. The only inspired Bible is the original Bible manuscripts, which we don't have. But if somebody could find them, they would be the Word of God. Read a few more books. We don't have them, but we can guess what they are. Read a few more books. My guess is good as yours, since I have more education than you do. My guess is better. You know what you call that? You call that Christian education. <laughs> Now, you know something? You know what that book says? That book says, stand, and having done all, stand. You study infantry combat, and the decisive element in any combat action is the infantry. You never replace them. You haven't got Iwo Jima until you got your feet on Iwo Jima. You can shout offshore with 16-inch naval guns. There ain't nothing left there but sand. When you get on there, some guy will come out of that sand and blow your head off. The decisive element in all combat is infantry because you're fighting over land. And there's somebody on that land, and you get on there. You know the secret of not no compromise? Stand. Get that thing and stand, and don't you give right, don't you give left, don't you give forward, don't you give backward. If you got a British square, if one man gives way, there's a hole in the ranks. You fellas play football a lot of you. What happens when one man don't make a block? Red dog got quarterback, come right through. Stand. And having done all, stand. Let's stand. Let's stand. I'm not going to give an invitation tonight. I'm going to close service here tonight. And uh, let you take these things home and think about them. And meditate on them. And uh, if you haven't been the soldier you've been for the Lord, you ask God to give you some backbone, okay? I've been talking to all of you, but some of you know who you are. You know who you are. And some of you fellows about my age and a little bit older and never done anything for Jesus Christ, you don't know how much time you got left. And if I were you, if I were you, I'd get out there and do something. Now, I know a spring chicken. I got seven children and three grandchildren, a fourth one on the way. And before this year is over, I'm going to get out in the street of my hometown at least four more times and stand at the back end of a truck and tell them they're going to go to hell and burn. And if you fellows can't think of something to do, pray. Say, God, give me something to do. Christmas time comes up here in Rochester. I've met a lot of folks around here Christmas time in these shopping centers. Go down to a big shopping center. I mean, some of you guys, 50 and 60, go down to a big shopping center and get your little box or a foot rail by a soda fountain and stand up there and say, I mean, really, really, 
stand up there and say, hey, folks. <laughs> People turn around and look at you like thought you were nuts. <laughs> Say, folks, I just want to tell you I've been born again, know the Lord Jesus Christ. Merry Christmas and walk out of there. You'll shake up there day, brother. All right, brother, come ahead. Be a good soldier. Endure hardness. Fight the good fight. Amen. A great message packed with truth. Who, uh, who brought at least five visitors tonight? Now, Charlie Perkins, you don't count. You aren't, you aren't a critter. Any of our people bring five visitors? I might have to give it to that preacher if you guys oh, didn't. They don't have to be your people. Okay. Yeah, but this preacher brought his whole church. <laughs> Anybody bring four? I got I got two people that brought four visitors. I'll give them one Sunday morning, and I'll give them one Sunday night, and the picture this one. All right, that's fair enough. Okay, so you three folk got a picture coming. We got we've already had three. You got five. Okay, well we got three pictures. So you can have one. Over here gets one. Who who was it over here? I saw. All right, very good. And Charlie, you you need this down there in Auburn. Amen. Amen, brother. Come on up here a minute, will you? This guy doesn't believe the King James Bible, but we're working on him. <laughs> no, nah, it's not true. He's number one. He believes even the cover. Amen. Brother Perkins, pastors of First Bible Baptist Church of Auburn, New York, we're thrilled at what God's doing down there and whatever part God allowed us to have in, in establishing that work, we're grateful. And uh, maybe you'd like to say one word about what's happening and then lead us in prayer. Well, we've got lots happening. People's getting saved and the building's going up and uh, we've got a lot of folks in the battle and we're just rejoicing. We're still very grateful for you folks that have helped us get started down there. We're consistently running over 100 and have people saved every week, every day almost. We've got a lot of soul winners, and uh, we got a bus, thanks to the First Bible Baptist Church of Rochester. Some of you may not know it, but you gave us a bus. Amen? Amen. And uh, we're going to start a bus ministry one of these days, so God's really blessing, and we're just delighted in what uh, he's doing down there, and I want to thank all you folks again. Uh, for praying for us and standing by us and uh, trying to work on Brother Ruckman now. I told him this evening that uh, since he's able to come to the second best church in New York, he ought to try the first. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> no, I got 30 over there that believe it. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we just acquired a tremendous youth director. And uh, you know who he is, don't you? Put him in a home today. He got his furniture down there. And we're just rejoicing about him. And Brother Mike Metzger and Louise, they're coming down. Maybe you don't know them, some of you. But we're really, really fortunate in getting those folks. We'll take all people like you that we can get. Amen? And yeah, the rest of you like to move down to Auburn, we'd like to have you. <laughs> pray. Uh, oh, pray. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the old black book. Thank you for Brother Ruckman, and thank you for this message. God, help us to be better soldiers. Thank you, Lord, that we can uh, come together and hear the Word of God. We pray, Lord, we'll go out and take our stand for Jesus and for the Word and for soul winning. And God, thank you so much for saving us. And we pray, Lord, if there's one here that's not saved, that they might turn their heart to Jesus and they might be saved tonight. Thank you, dear God, for this good pastor and these people in this church. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless the remaining services this week, that it would honor and glorify the Savior. And we know it will, because God's man is here, and we thank you, Lord, for his ministry. And we pray you continue to bless him and, and guide him and lift him up, and thank you for him. And, Lord, now we ask that you'd give us traveling mercies, and you'd help us to go home and endeavor to uh, take the sword of the Spirit 
and to use it, Lord. And we'll just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You dismissed. You know why I haven't called you up to take your bass fishing?